bit of Lev Oberyn, who was another famous teacher. So you know, I I've, I have I have absorbed a lot of information in piano methods and traits from them directly. You know, it's it's it was quite interesting for me over the years. For about five years, I studied with with Russian with Russian school, you know, uh, through the Russian school. In this picture here, this as as, as a matter of introduction, I would like just to show two interest. Interesting pictures from, from uh, the Moscow Conservatory, this one, with Richter sitting at the piano. It's, it's a little smaller. And this is Heinrich Negaus teaching uh, Richter. Yeah, he was here about uh, 20 years old, and some other, some other famous faces here. And this one is a little older picture um, with Zverev, a famous teacher at the Conservatory of uh, Moscow, with Alexander Skriavin here, dressing in military uniform because he was a cadet at the time, going to, to military school, and also Rachmaninoff here. They, they graduated together at the same time, along with Metner and Levine, yeah. famous people graduating at the conservatory. So just, just uh, two, two images from two different periods of the time that gives a sense, I think, uh, of, of the weight of mm, people taught in Russia, you know, very serious, posing with the teacher, uh, all well dressed up here, same, same thing, everybody paying a lot of attention, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, this was a very, very typical image. Now, uh, I think, I think, since I talked to Juan that we are going to do this a few times, um, so this is going to be called, let's say, the part one of this uh, Russian presentation. So of course it would be great if at least the ones that, you're, that are here can come again. So, you know, we have a continuation of, of the talk, you know. So today is going to be more um, focused on history, on not, not Russian history per se, but just, just a, few, a few details and uh, an overlook, take an overlook of the, of the Russian school. And then perhaps next session we'll talk more in detail about pedagogy, methods, books, we'll watch videos, we'll listen to audios, we can do that today a little bit too. But it would be very important to understand, by the way, if you need to interrupt me at some point, uh, I do, yes, and uh, I'll decide if I want to answer or not. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to interrupt, ask any time, please, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's quite a right if because there is something that, because of my accent, you don't understand. I know they will, but, uh, <laughs> but maybe if you, if you don't, you know, I'm going to try to speak as clearly as, as I can, but yeah, it's going well. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> so, very good. So, let's, let's, let's start by saying, what's a piano school? What's a piano school? Anyway, a tradition. That's one aspect of it. A anybody else? They have um, sort of like um, aspects on technique and, and maybe even interpretation. And that's good, that's it. good. Uh, sir, do you have any ideas? The way of approach. Uh, approach, yes, good. That's all, any idea? It's all been said. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <Andrea. laughs> Method. Yes, yes. Very good, because many times I get an answer like this. Oh, piano school is a building where people <laughs> teach piano, yes? And it makes a lot of sense, but <laughs> yes. we don't understand piano school or piano tradition like that. It's, it's everything that you have set together, right? Something that builds over the years with every new generation of pianists and teachers and pedagogues adding something to what was taught mm. before, right? And, and this is what happens over a long, a long period of time. Then I'll talk a little bit about Russian history and why it's so important. Uh, so this is what we're going to basically take a look throughout the next few sessions, and whatever the number of sessions we do, but, uh, you know, a few sessions, influences of Russian piano school, where it comes from, the founders, of course, the first conservatories, St. Petersburg and Czech and Moscow, in this order. Um, we're going to talk about what happened before the Soviet Union, during the Soviet Union, after the Soviet Union, because it's a little different, actually. When people say the Russian piano school, it has always been like that, it's not true. The, the, from 1917, after the revolution, there were a lot of, many changes with communism, many changes in methods, 
in the approach of the government towards the people, towards the population in terms of music teaching. So it's very, very important to know what happened after and during and after, and, and after the Soviet era. Also, we're going to talk specifically about the main teachers and pianists and pedagogues at the Conservatory of Moscow and St. Petersburg throughout the years. We're going to listen to them, we're going to also watch them, and we're going to see what they wrote, how they taught, and things like this. Uh, I'm going to try to be as objective as possible. So if I say, for instance, that uh, certain passage has to be taught in a certain way, it's because someone has said that. I will say who said that. I don't agree or I don't disagree. I'm just going to state the facts as much as I can. So it's not, it's not a, a subjective presentation. It's as historical as, as possible, as accurate as possible to what I've done in research throughout the years. Um, okay, this is, this is good. So, origins of piano schools. Where do piano schools, or when, at, at which point in history did piano schools start? What do you think? From the very beginning? From the very beginning of what? Yeah, but what? Uh, almost from the very beginning of piano, of the construction of the piano, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, simple, it's a simple, it's a simple question, but it's very important to have it in mind. So, with the first, with the construction of the first instruments uh, by 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 Christopher, Christopher uh, yeah, we just actually Andrea and I. Uh, passed by train uh, through Padova in Italy, where he was born, actually. Oh. So around, let's say, 1700, more or less, roughly, just not to get into detail now, when the first piano, uh, the first experiments by Christopher were done, then the first pianists also uh, start to appear, and the first piano traditions start to, to uh, emerge as well. Yeah? So it's important, yeah? The more or less, I'm not going to get into details about when exactly the piano was built because that, that it's another, another discussion. But So around 1700, let's say. Now, a school of playing, I wrote this because I think it's quite important, it's founded less on any certain definite features of playing than a collective understanding of a technical and interpretive, in, interpretive tradition. So there are many, many things that sometimes are, they coexist, things that could be opposing to each other sometimes in a, in a school. Uh, this happens a lot, especially in Russia. We'll, you, you, will see, you will see why later. I don't know if this is clear, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. So, um, because every, everybody has something personal to add, every teacher. And sometimes you, you see that, how is this possible? It's contradictory. But uh, this, this happens in a piano tradition. We have to try to keep that uh, broad mind sense, you know, to understand what's, what's going on. Uh, after World War II, this uh, well-known, all these well-known piano schools started to disappear because of globalization, of people moving from one country to another. So for, for many years, Russian school of piano playing was quite definite. So was the French, so was the German. In a less degree, Italian and Hungarian and British, American, Asian, of course, is much, much newer, and there are sub-categories inside, and the Catalonian. Catalonian refers to this region of Spain in the northeast, Barcelona, and that area where Albeniz, Granados, uh, Ricard Vignes, uh, Alicia de la Rocha, all these people came from, you know, from that area. So this is a specific school, too. So, they were very definite, Russian, French, German, up to the Second World War. Then people started to travel a lot. They did it before, but much more after the war. So you have a lot of Russians teaching in the US, for instance, uh, French teaching in Asia, Germans teaching in Spain, and things like that, right? And, and uh, Argentinians teaching in London, <laughs> Spanish teaching in London also, you know, Croatian teaching in London. So it, 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 happens, it happens a lot. So uh, since uh, 1700, these schools started to emerge because people didn't travel that much back then. So they remain more isolated. 
Therefore, the characteristics of each school were more definite, more, more precise. But then uh, everything started to change. More and more up, up to nowadays, it would be very hard to say if a pianist comes from this or that school. Very hard, I think, nowadays. It's still possible in some instances, but it's very hard. Any questions so far? No. No? That's a good thing. <laughs> Either everything is very clear or you don't understand anything and you don't want to ask. <laughs> All right, uh, now let's go, let's get into specifics about Russia. Uh, it's, it's very important, all these uh, points here, because Russia came into piano history much later than the rest of Europe. It was close to, to Europe because um, it was behind. Everything came to um, culture arrived to Russia much later from the West, from Europe. Mm. Uh, even the, fun, the foundation of, of, of the Russian empire, uh, history as, as we know today only happened on this year. Before it was not unified. This stands for common era because some people, some people, uh, don't, I'm not sure about this. Mm. So it's it's you know about uh, eleven hundred years ago. So the Russian Empire is very important to keep in mind because uh, this means this means that uh, they were they were kings and tsars and and aristocracy and nobility and a big gap between that and the peasants and people who who had no no you know no money whatsoever. So there was there was a big gap. So there was nothing happening in between. You know, uh, the music only happened. At the court, at the palace. Now, of course, you all know the Bolshevik Revolution in October 1917 that changed everything. There were a lot of upheavals up to that at, at the beginning of the 20th century, up to the revolution. Then uh, the Communist Party came to power, and uh, it had a lot of good things for for uh, education. They standardized education in many ways, they established methods, rules, a very specific syllabus that I will show you later, uh, incredibly specific, incredibly tough. Um, that's why a lot of people came out with uh, so, such a good preparation for, for, from, from the Soviet uh, schools. But this is just an introduction. If uh, you have questions now, wait, because we'll get into detail, in, in very specific detail. And then, of course, the Soviet Union collapsed in '91, and people started going to Moscow to study. The level uh, lowered a little bit. Uh, you pay, you know, not like you are n nobody. You can, you could access, but if you could pay the, the tuition and you manage, you could go to Moscow Conservatory. Uh, not to, you know, underestimate the level, but it went down a little bit. This is important. Uh, one among the many exodus that happened of Jewish Russian people, uh, the one in the 70s, it was very important because a lot, a lot of pianists, a lot of musicians, Russian musicians, and not only Russian, but from all over the place, happened to be Jewish, right? Um, uh, as an anecdote, Vladimir Horvich, and uh, I, I apologize in advance if, if this hurts any feelings, I just want to say what, uh, what uh, Horvich said. There were three types of pianists, Jewish, gay, or bad pianist. You know? <laughs> so, this is something that Horowitz said, you know, he's, he's recorded to, to have said this. It's a funny thing, but let's say that let's, it's important, you know, uh, all people, Oystra, Richter, Horowitz, all these people were, were Jewish people, you know. And um, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't know if there's anybody Jewish here. Or no. I am a quarter. Uh, you are a quarter Jew, but yeah. it's, it's very interesting that there's, there's something, something to, to talk about there, you know. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people left Russia and went to Europe, went to the US where the money was, and they started to teach there. So mm -hmm. they brought with them what they had learned over years in Russia to other parts of the world. So that's why it's important. And then, of course, uh, uh, in modern times, we, we can talk about that later, but not so much. I'm, not, I'm more interested in what happens before the revolution, during the Soviet era. Uh, this is what appeals to me more, and I think it's where the foundations were laid off for, for the Russian school. Mm -hmm. 
question so far or is it going well? Yeah? Perfect. Yes. Tita 1 is probably a bit too specific, but... Um, no, but go ahead. The October Revolution, so where, when Lenin came into power? Um, yes. Did it mainly start with when he took power or when it was mainly when Stalin? Because I heard that he had Stalin, Stalin came was, after. Mm. Was that in the 1920s? Or yes, he came after. It's Lenin, Stalin, then Khrushchev. Mm. Who, who really changed mm. everything for for better? Yeah, I heard that Stalin really did cause problems, like the composer like Shostakovich and Prokofiev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Shostakovich is set to you know to compose in in a certain code. Mm. You know, uh, you all know this. You know, you're, she's a composer and she knows better. Yeah, like uh, he was very ironic in his music, yeah. trying to please the. Yeah. Did he hide some of his music as well? So no did he hide some of his music as well? The the ones that. Didn't he, he couldn't expose uh, his music, yeah. or he, he had to change some, some things because he, he knew that the, I mean, in power they, they wouldn't like it. Yeah. And he got a yeah. And then he but never left. Composer, uh, yeah. He really never left Russia. He he left Russia. He traveled a little bit, but he was always a composer, you know, yeah. for Russia, you know. And, uh, but he was very smart because he could please the yeah. the government yeah. and at the same time be very creative, right? Uh, not easy to do, I think. Okay. Um, he could quote some melodies, so yes, yes. even in, in, in his music. Oh, yes. Really oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, the, the Russian uh, piano school um, was born out of a variety of factors like everything else, usually. Uh, historical events, the government, uh, the presence of great minds in the pedagogy of, of Russia. Uh, the methodic work, Western European influences, very important, folkloric music, music in the home, freedom versus control, I'm going to try to explain a little bit of this, general versus particular, and the common traits that we can find is always the technique is in relation to the artistic goals. But people think that Russian are very technical, but they always taught technique and an art and always try to achieve, even the scales in the arpeggios were taught in an artistic way, with crescendi, diminuendi, uh, accelerandi, all, always, always, always like this. Um, <clears throat> well, why is, for instance, the folkloric music and music in the home was very important, because they all, all kids could sing at home. It was so important. Uh, this before the before the piano as an instrument came arrived to to Russia. We're going to see that later. It was very important because music was present in the houses in the homes a lot. For instance, in my house that, that didn't happen. What about your house? Not so much. Not right? so much. Did you sing a lot? Uh, no. Uh, what about you? People always listen to music. Yes, that's a good thing. What about what about you? Nothing. Okay. And Juan, nothing. And you. Yeah, you see, so <laughs> this didn't happen in Russia in the 19th, in the 18th, 19th century. That didn't happen in 20th century. That didn't happen. It was music was there always, and Russian people are famous for this. Yeah, mm. for singing, drinking, and always singing, singing at home, uh, perhaps to fight the cold. Uh, but uh, mm. it's present. They didn't have anything else. They all they, they only had this. So it's it's quite important. Um, <coughs> Also, freedom versus control is because uh, what I mean by that is there is quite a lot of uh, emphasis on methods and rigor and, and to be very accurate with the way of teaching, but at the same time, the teacher always allowed leeway for the student to be creative and be personal. Mm -hmm. Always, the system was always, there, although there was a system, it was always adaptable to the student, something that to the needs and qualities of the students. Some, some, something that, for instance, in my experience, going through one conservatory in three universities in my life, I've never encountered this. You know, you have to follow the method, you know? They were <coughs> flexible, and this is very interesting, you know? If, if you were extremely good at Bach after a year and you couldn't play other things well, you could do that, you know? And you would meet with the teacher and they could, they could arrange the program according to your needs. It's, this is interesting to know and to, to point out. The Western European influences we are going to see now uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of moments. So as I said before, the piano was uh, only present in, at the court. 
And it's interesting to see that the first piano in Russia, in Russia appeared only in the 1770s. In the 1770s, Haydn was already uh, had been alive for quite a while since 1732. So so was Carl Philipp Mahler Bach mm -hmm. for about 60 years, composing for the pianoforte writing. Um, Mozart, Clementi, for sure, also. Uh, so the piano only arrived much later. The first Russian piano work. 1780. It's quite late. It, Beethoven was 10 years old already, mm. and Mozart was 14 years old. So it's it's very late. The first only. Yeah? Now, and even the first recorded concert by a Russian pianist in the 1790, yeah? a year before Mozart died, for instance. Uh, so they didn't even have an harpsichord in there. Uh, they had harpsichords in the, at, at court, but the piano as an instrument arrived much later. Much later, yes. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, they did. They did. But everything arrived much later mm -hmm. in terms of, of art. Um, now, the interesting thing is that they went from basically nothing, not having schools, not having conservatories, not having a piano tradition, from that to creating incredible masterpieces. So we have. Um, a, a little later, we are going to see that we have uh, Balakirev composing Islamé in uh, pictures on an exhibition, first piano concerto by Tchaikovsky, not, not much later uh, than, than, you know, they didn't, it didn't take long for them to, to achieve. To